Over the years, I've made quite a few videos on invasive species, but I sometimes worry that people get the wrong idea from my videos. Yes, introducing non-native species will almost certainly have a negative effect on the ecosystem, but this topic is far more complicated than most people believe. Most ecosystems are extremely fragile, and there are many complicated relationships within these ecosystems that keep them healthy. When a non-native species is introduced, they usually compete with the native species or completely eradicate them. Surprisingly, this isn't always the case, as sometimes introduced species can help struggling endangered species, and sometimes they can fill the role of an extinct animal in their new ecosystem. In today's video, I will be going through just a few of these cases, and we can start off in Hawaii. Hawaii is a uniquely beautiful island state, but it's also a hub for invasive species. Over the years, many non-native species have been intentionally and unintentionally introduced, and some of these species have failed and some have been successful. Some species have been introduced to try and boost farming and deal with pests, and some have managed to sneak onto the islands on trade ships. Most of these species have had a massive negative effect on the native wildlife, and some have even led to extinctions. Some of the worst invasive species on Hawaii are predators, as Hawaii has very few native predators. This meant that the introduced species had little competition, as the native species were not used to dealing with predators, and they were ill-equipped to deal with the new threat. In this sense, Hawaii and New Zealand have very similar stories, and just like New Zealand, Hawaii has many beautiful endemic birds. Unfortunately, a lot of these birds are now extinct, and part of the reason behind this is invasive birds and predators. The invasive predators will actively hunt the native birds and feed on their eggs, and the introduced birds will compete with the native species. Some of the invasive species will fit into both of these categories as predatory birds such as barn owls have been introduced. The amount of introduced species means that there is less food to go around and many of the non-native species brought over diseases from distant lands. Despite the long list of negative effects on the ecosystem, some non-native birds have started to help the ecosystem to heal. After many of the native birds went extinct, some of the native plant species would also suffer due to their absence. This could have led to yet more damage to the ecosystem as many of the native animals relied on the native plants, but thankfully some of the introduced species have taken over the extinct birds' roles in the ecosystem. Most native forest plants in Hawaii depend on birds for seed dispersal and some rely on small birds for pollination. The introduced birds have taken over this role after the extinction of the native birds, and so far this has limited the damage. You could argue that without the introduction of the non-native birds, the native birds would not have gone extinct, but this isn't exactly true. Most animal extinctions are due to multiple factors, and the Hawaiian birds mostly went extinct due to invasive species, loss of habitat, and poaching. This story just illustrates how complicated relationships between plants and animals can be, and even though the non-native birds shouldn't be in Hawaii, at least they are helping in one way. Australia has a large number of invasive species across its landscapes, but in today's video I will not be focusing on these creatures. In the 1900s, all of the species that were introduced into Australia were not introduced to become a problem, but instead they were introduced to solve problems. Very little was known about animal introduction and its possible effects on the ecosystem and native animals, but thankfully today we know it can be very damaging. As I've already covered, most animal introductions were in an attempt to boost farming and control pests, but unfortunately many of these introductions were unsuccessful. The most famous example of this is the cane toad, as they have been introduced into many countries around the world to control beetle numbers, but they have caused a massive decline in predator numbers in Australia and around the world. Fortunately, not all of these introductions have been a failure, as some of them have been very successful. The Australian Dung Beetle Project was conceived and led by Dr. George Bornemissa, and it intended to introduce dung beetles into Australia. In the 1950s, when Dr. Bornemissa visited Australia, he noted that the farmland was covered in a large number of cowpats, and this wasn't common in Europe. In other parts of the world, cowpats are buried by dung beetles and recycled back into the earth, but in Australia, this wasn't happening. 
At first, this may not seem like such a big deal, but it can lead to an increase in the population of pest insects such as biting flies. Bushflies breed in unburied cow dung, and just one cow pat from a dairy cow can host 2,000 to 3,000 flies. Australia has quite a few dung beetle species of its own, but these insects are adapted to process the dung of native marsupials and not cattle. To try and solve this problem, 55 species of dung beetle were introduced into Australia from 1965 to 1985, and overall, the project has been a success. The beetles were introduced from Europe and Africa, and eventually some were introduced from Hawaii. Hawaii had had a similar problem with cowpats and hornflies, and the introductions had been successful. Not all of the introduced beetles became established in Australia, but today three of the species are still active across the country. In 2014, another dung beetle species was introduced to help with gaps in the system and the agriculture industry has benefited from the introductions. The dung beetles haven't exactly had a benefit on the ecosystem as they mostly benefit agriculture, but they haven't had a negative effect on the ecosystem either. Because they feed on dung that most of the native beetles can't process, they aren't competing with them. And by reducing the fly populations, they are limiting the damage on the livestock. This is one of the few introduced species success stories, but it's still extremely risky to introduce a non-native animal in the first place. If you know even the slightest bit about Florida and wildlife, then you know it has a problem with invasive species. Because of the risk of sounding like a broken record, I only try to include Florida when it's necessary, and this story fits under this category. Because Florida is full of vibrant wetland ecosystems, many of the invasive species in Florida can be found in and around the water. Most of these animals get to Florida through the pet trade, and this is thought to be the case for the non-native apple snails. When some people are unable to look after their aquatic pets, in some cases they will release them into the wild. This is known as aquarium dumping, and it's a very irresponsible and harmful thing to do. Today, Florida is home to several apple snail species, but only one of these species is native. The island apple snail is invasive in quite a few countries around the world due to its popularity in the aquarium trade, and they first became established in Florida in the 1990s. Since then, these creatures have multiplied at an astonishing rate, and they have had a massive impact on the native snails and the native plants. The island apple snail lays a larger number of eggs than the native apple snails and they feed on large quantities of aquatic plants. Many native aquatic species rely on these plants for food and as shelter from predators, and by reducing the density of aquatic plants they have a negative effect on the ecosystem and they are also known to spread diseases and parasites. Even though the apple snails are very bad news for the ecosystem, they have helped one native bird. The snail kite is an extremely specialised bird of prey and it feeds almost exclusively on apple snails. This species has a large distribution across North and South America and across most of its range it will feed on invasive apple snails. In Florida, they were one of the first species to be put on the US Fish and Wildlife Service's endangered species list and they had a population of less than 800 individuals in 2007. Since then, their numbers have been steadily growing, and as of 2022, there were thought to be around 3,000 snail kites in the Everglades. The reason behind this rebound is the increase in the invasive apple snail populations and also the work of conservationists. Even though the snail kite has benefited from this invasion, many other animals have suffered, and hopefully these birds will be able to control their numbers in the future. Feral livestock animals usually go under the radar as invasive species, but they can be extremely destructive. Feral livestock animals can outcompete native species and they are also notorious spreaders of disease. They not only damage the ecosystem as they can also have an impact on agriculture and today feral livestock animals are among the worst invasive species on the planet. In quite a few places around the world, escaped livestock animals have started to breed with wild animals and they have created strong hybrids. One great example of this is the feral pig and wild boar hybrids in Canada, and they have proven to be extremely difficult to control. Even though the wild boar and domesticated pigs are technically the same species, they are so different in shape and size that the hybrids are quite distinctive. 
Feral donkeys are an issue in some places such as Australia and they were first brought to the country in 1866. They were introduced to be used as pack and haulage animals but today they are feral and there are an estimated 5 million individuals across Australia. They cause damage to native plants and also contribute to soil erosion which can massively affect the landscape. This case is possibly the most interesting and complex of all the cases so far because even though feral livestock animals can have a massive negative effect on the ecosystem, they can benefit certain ecosystems where animals have gone extinct. Some people argue that the introduction of large non-native species into an ecosystem where large animals have been eradicated is a form of rewilding, and in some areas it has been beneficial. In most healthy ecosystems, large animals work as ecosystem engineers by dispersing seeds and increasing plant diversity. Rewilding by reintroducing extinct animals has proven to be very successful and popular in places such as the UK, but studies have shown that they don't have to be native to be a success. In a previous video, I covered the ambitious project to try and introduce large herbivores into Siberia to try and stop the thawing of permafrost, and this is an interesting example of how animals can help to battle climate change and help to revitalise dormant ecosystems. Towards the end of the Pleistocene, the world lost a large number of its megafauna and this led to ecosystems rapidly changing. The aim of Pleistocene rewilding is to bring back these ecosystems and by restoring large herbivores, greenhouse gas levels can be lowered and grazers can also reduce the frequency of fires. Browsing and grazing also increases nutrient cycling, which can increase plant productivity and maintain ecosystem productivity. The main criticism to this form of rewilding is that the world is functionally different to how it was 10,000 years ago, but this is a common argument for most rewilding reintroductions. Of course there are many pros and cons to this type of rewilding, but as climate change continues to worsen, we may need to use more extreme methods. Animals aren't the only non-native organisms that can have a positive impact on the ecosystem as non-native plants can also help. Invasive plants can cause just as much damage as invasive animals and they are arguably harder to get rid of. Invasive plants not only affect the ecosystem but they can also cause damage to agriculture and infrastructure. Japanese knotweed is one of the worst invasive plants in the world mainly due to its ability to penetrate hard surfaces such as concrete and brick. This can lead to buildings collapsing and they also shade out many native plants. Some invasive plants will completely outcompete native plants but in a few cases they have aided native species. Some endangered butterfly species have been able to rebound due to the abundance of non-native flowering plants. Some species such as the monarch butterfly are very picky about what plants they lay their eggs on and others are very picky about what plants they eat. This means that butterfly populations are massively affected by the abundance of plants, but when plants start to disappear it doesn't always mean that it's game over. In areas where essential plants have started to disappear, butterflies have started to adapt and feed on non-native plants. In some places this has had surprising effects as it's made some species more immune to viral infections. This is especially the case with peacock butterflies as studies have shown that caterpillars infected with a virus were 11 times more likely to survive when raised on exotic plants. Invasive plants can provide food and important habitat to endangered species, but if an animal depends on a certain species to survive, invasive plants can be very bad news. I've made a few other videos similar to this one so if you think I've missed out a story then it's probably in one of these videos. Thanks to the people who suggested that I revisit this topic and if you have any other suggestions then let me know down in the comments below. But until next time, goodbye.